pleasure to welcome everybody here. I see some familiar faces and I see some new faces. I'll just really briefly let you all know that the library is a nonprofit. It's membership based and it's funded solely by membership and donations and it's completely run by volunteers. So Dr. Corona is on the board, he's a volunteer. Rob, the camera is also a volunteer and so am I. The librarian's a volunteer, everybody that operates the library. Um, our mission is to provide access to a lot of the historical records for the Virgin Islands and the Caribbean in general, and also to have educational workshops and lectures to get the community to come in and, and use the resources and learn about the history, culture, and of course family genealogy. And today we have Dr. Caron, and he's going to give a presentation on the port of Charlotte of Mali between 1790 and 1803. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Brown. Yeah. Thank you, Sophia. Um, it's Charlotte Amal. Yeah. <laughs> I know you corrected me by email. I want to be a purist. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it, it was named by the Danish queen. And some misguided uh, Navy, U.S. Navy officer changed it just because the French colony in St. Thomas, of course, would want to use a French spelling because it, it looked more classy. So that's the only reason why today it's supposed to be uh, Charlotte d'Amari. But originally, Margaret? Yes? You have I'm any not the comment? only latest expert here. There are lots of them around. Yes. <laughs> what was your question? <laughs> Isn't Charlotte Amalia the proper spelling? If you want it. The original spelling. I-A, yes. But Thank it's not you. pronounced that way if you want to pronounce it in Danish. Oh, okay. <laughs> then it's, then it's Charlotte Amalia. You're having your at the end. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. <laughs> Amelia. 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 Am I rising? Repeat, repeat that pronunciation. Uh, Charlotte Amelia. Amelia. Charlotte Amelia. Yeah, yeah, you have like a yeah, it's not Amelia. 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 That's, that's, that's a real yeah. name, he's right. Thank you. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, this is, this talk is going to be from a paper I'm about to publish, so for that reason, I didn't, uh, I, I didn't distribute anything about this talk. Uh, it'll be very shortly available, um, either in paper here at the library or uh, on, the, on the web uh, through uh, Rob's uh, good services. So um, let us start then. The Dutch and, and French Caribbean ports, starting in the mid-17th century and throughout the 18th century until the French Revolution, the Dutch port of Williamstad on the island of Curaçao, uh, with its commodious protected harbor at the Santa Ana Bay, was the first and very successful international emporium within the Caribbean basin. Curaçao supplied illicitly the Spanish mainland, only 40 miles south. The French and the English islands with African slaves, draft animals, and Dutch goods and equipment in exchange for sugar, tobacco, cotton, coffee, cocoa, and other tropical products. Then in the 18th century, many French and British smugglers and successful Curaçao merchants decided to increase the volume of their illicit trade <coughs> by establishing an emporium branch at the small roadstead of Orange Stud in the tiny island of uh, St. Eustatius in the Leeward Islands, which was much closer to the French and the English sugar islands. This port was also very prosperous, particularly during the American War of Independence, which it was uh, when it was an, import, an important supplier of Washington's uh, army until Admiral Rodney sacked it in 1781. At, on the other hand, the French had three important thriving Caribbean ports in the 18th century, 
Saint-Pierre in Martinique, Bastère in Guadeloupe, and especially Cap Francois, today uh, Cape Haitian, Cap Francois in northern Saint-Domingue. At the turn of the 18th century, three new rivaling ports were being developed, Port Royal, or Fort Royal rather, in, in Martinique, Pointe-à-Pitre, in Guadeloupe and Port-au-Prince in Saint-Domingue. However, because the French exclusivity policy before the revolution, these ports could trade legally only with French metropolitan ports through French vessels. The same situation prevailed at the two uh, important British ports of Bridgetown and Barbados uh, to the south and Kingston, Jamaica to the north. Finally, it should be noted that from uh, 1793 until 1815, with a brief hiatus in 1802 and 1803, maritime communications and trade in and between the French, the Dutch, Antilles, and Europe were severely disrupted during Franco-British conflicts. Clearly, the French Revolution and Napoleonic Wars caused great economic losses uh, and, of course, social disruption uh, in the French and the Dutch islands, much more so than in the British West Indies. What about the Danish island of St. Thomas? Well, the Danes were late comers in the Caribbean. They came nearly 50 years after the French, the English, and the Dutch. The Danish West India and Guinea Company established itself at St. Thomas in 1672 with the double aim of producing a limited amount of tropical products on this small rocky island and of emulating the Dutch at Curaçao by engaging in international trade, exchanging African captives as well as, as European goods and supplies for tropical products. As an international emporium, the port of St. Thomas officially named Charlotte Amalia in 1692 in honor of the Danish queen had several political and geographical advantages. It developed a tradition of neutrality during European conflicts. It allowed privateers and smugglers from any nation to come to Charlotte Amalia to auction off, sell, or trade their prizes and smuggle goods. It is strategically located at the junction of the Greater and the Lesser Antilles, only 45 miles east of a much larger Spanish island of Puerto Rico, and it too has a commodious harbor protected from most winds that could hold at least 150 vessels of varying size. According to French naturalist André Pierre Ledru, who visited St. Thomas for a period of three months in spring 1697, quotes, its harbor was one of the safest in the archipelago. Its entrance, although narrow, is so easy to navigate that there is no pilot in charge of bringing in foreign vessels. On February 29th, I counted 90 vessels of all size, most of them under the Danish flag. The others the other flags, that is, were American, French, English, and also from Hamburg, the city of Hamburg. On the negative side, the Danish West India Company suffered from three major hindrances. The Danish sea power was sizably inferior to that of the Dutch, the English, the French, or the Spaniards. The manufacturing capacity of the Danes was greatly inferior to that of the other European powers, and the Danish company was unable to enter into any trade agreement with any of the other European colonies 
where economic exclusivism was the official practice. Thus, international trade that Charlotte Amalia had to be surreptitious and it was tolerated by other nations only in times of dire need during European conflicts and only as long as Denmark remained neutral. Finally, the harbor has one, most imp one important liability which is beyond human control. It is unprotected from storms coming from the south, which can cause terrible ravages. On August 13, 1793, a hurricane devastated Charles de Maria. Out of a total of 47 vessels in the harbor, all were lost except for one schooner and the brig Jane from Altona. The whole, quotes, the whole roof of a government building was lifted and slammed into a schooner that sank. Windows hermetically closed and secured with iron hooks were broken into. The wind insinuated itself in the smallest cracks and bent or pulled nails out. The storm was so violent that a large beam was lifted in the air, projected into a house and crushed it. Fortunately, these destructive hurricanes occur rarely more than once every 10 years." Unquote. This is from uh, Le Drude, the, the French uh, uh, visitor. In the early years, through a series of European conflicts, international trade and Charlotte Amalia grew apace until the Peace Treaty of Utrecht in 1712 after which the economy declined and the Danish company became insolvent. After operating with no profit or at a loss for some 40 years, King Frederick V, at the company's request, assumed control of the islands, St. Thomas, St. John, and St. Croix, in 1754. And he was able to revive the economy through wise management policies. Trade improved measurably, especially during the Seven Year War, 1756 to 1763, between France and England, and after the first St. Thomas Free Trade Ordinance of uh, 1764 and 1767, uh, the American War of Independence, 1775 to 1783, the second St. Thomas Free Trade Ordinance of 1782, and the early years of the French Revolution that took place uh, between 1789 and 1799. However, following the execution of uh, Louis XVI in January 93, a state of war was declared between Republican France and monarchical Britain. In the Antilles, this led the British to seize all French, Dutch, and Spanish vessels and to invade Guadeloupe and Saint-Domingue in 1793, Martinique in 1794, and Trinidad in 1797. In addition, because the Netherlands had joined the French Republic as the Batavia Republic, the British blockaded St. Eustatius and Curaçao from 1795 and occupied them in uh, 1801 and from 1810 until 1816 to keep the French out of these islands. Uh, in December 1800, Denmark lost its neutrality by joining a Russian League of Neutral Nations in favor of Napoleon. As a result, the British wanted to interdict all trade between the Danish West Indies and the European continent, including France, the Netherlands, Denmark, Spain, Italian ports, and the Antilles. Additionally, the British wanted to prevent French privateers from using Danish harbors. 
Thus, after blockading Charlotte Amalia Harbor for several months, on uh, March 27, 1801, the British attacked St. Thomas and with uh, 25 ships and more than 3,000 men. A brief naval battle ensued. Thanks, thanks to you did? Not then, a month earlier. <laughs> oh, it's a month earlier? Oh, yes. Well, anyway, I, I want to recommend uh, Mr. Consalvo's paper on the subject. It's, it's a beautiful piece of research. Thank you. Um, at any rate, as, as a result, the, um, the uh, Danish commandant capitulated and the British troops landed to occupy Charlotte Amalia until the Treaty of Amiens in February of the following year. During that British occupation period, trade was severely restricted to Great Britain, America, and the British West Indies. But as soon as the British departed, trade rebounded at Charlotte Amalia, especially um, despite, rather, despite the resumption of the Franco-British privateering war after May 1803 when war was declared again between Great Britain and France. In 1804 and in 1806, two devastating fires consumed nearly the whole town of Charlotte Amalia. The financial losses were enormous, but the economy was so strong that the recovery was rapid. In September 1807, following Denmark's decision to ally itself with Napoleon, and blockade England, the British Navy destroyed the Danish Navy, bombarded Copenhagen for five days, and completed its destruction by setting the city on fire. Three months later, the Danish West Indian Islands were subjected to a second British invasion and an occupation that lasted eight years and that severely restricted trade again. Finally, with Napoleon's ultimate defeat and the ensuing Treaty of Vienna in 1815, the British naval garrison departed, international trade at Charlotte Amalia revived with unprecedented vigor, and the harbor town entered its first economic golden era. It would appear that the year of 1800 represents a significant peak in the democratic demographic rather, and economic development of Charlotte Amalia. This peak was not to be surpassed until 1817, after the second British occupation. The activity of the port retrogressed dramatically during the first occupation in 1801, but in 1802 and 1803, it regained half of the ground lost. However, because the year of 1803 is better documented than 1800, it was thought useful to focus on that year and break the history of the first major economic boom of Charlotte Amalia into two periods of 14 years each. The first one from 1790 until 1803, and the second one from 1804 to 1817. We're now going to talk about the town of Charlotte Amalia. In 1803, Charlotte Amalia, a town of about 1,000 wooden structures, extended from today's head of Pave Street at the east end of today's Buckhole, at the west end. Along both sides of the uh, Main Street roughly parallel to the shore of the harbor. From the Main Street, side streets extended south to the seashore and north of Norigada through East Savan and north of Drenigan's Gada Main Street up Commandant Gada between Government Hill and Denmark Hill 
an up general gara between Denmark Hill and Frenchman Hill through Savannah. South of the main street between Kamdan Gara and, and Neves Fair Gara, I don't know exactly how to pronounce it. You'll forgive the Frenchman. Right. Yes, Marcus. absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, warehouses with private finger piers in parallel rows extended into the shallow northern end of the harbor. The big merchants who owned or rented warehousing space conducted little retail business. They bought and sold merchandise primarily in ship road quantities, which was loaded and unloaded from the piers. On the north side of the main street was, were mostly two-story buildings with a shop below and a residence above. To the north and at both ends of the main street, were two residential areas, which had been laid out by Governor von Prock in 1764 and 1765. To the east was Newtown, or East Savan, King's Quarter, with large lots for the Europeans, and to the west was Savan, with smaller lots for the free colors. As described by Le Dru in 1797, the capital, Charlotte Amalia, is one of the wealthiest of America with merchandise of all sorts. Built at the foot of mountains, on the edge of the harbor, it consists, so to speak, of a single run along street, both the houses built irregularly, but the houses built irregularly are lacking in the good taste an elegance that may be noted in other colonies. One could count barely 250 houses in 1789. That number has increased by half since then through the extraordinary influx of refugee colonists." Unquote. In 1803, although a fast-growing port and a booming trading center, Charlotte Amalia was courting serious disasters of various kinds. In the first place, the whole town was built out of wood with narrow streets, no fire lanes, and no fire control ordinances. The town was therefore subject to total destruction by fire, as occurred the following year. Although in 1796 already in 1796, the warehouse of the prominent merchant Peter Fogarty was totally destroyed by fire, a loss of more than $10,000, and 300 sailors were required to stop the fire from spreading to other buildings. Secondly, as was seen earlier, the town was with its flimsy wooden structures was subject to severe destruction by hurricanes as occurred in August 1793. Finally, in the wake of such hurricanes, with the lack of municipal health controls, with raw sewage flowing directly in the harbor, <coughs> with the accumulation of garbage in the northwest corner of the harbor near Estate Altena, and with the arrival of uninspected vessels from ports around the world. Charlotte Amalia was subject to devastating epidemics, particularly yellow fever epidemics, which were deadly to native Europeans, as occurred in the fall of 1793. <coughs> Nevertheless, Europeans kept coming in ever greater numbers running away from war and poor economic conditions, hoping to make a fortune quickly and to be able to retire at a safer location where they might live long enough to enjoy their financial gains. <coughs> Le Druc noted that on St. Thomas, quotes, a wise tolerance allows all religions to be practiced at five and five are fully represented, unquote. 
according to the 1803 tax list, Charlotte de Maria had two churches and three parish halls. These structures were built, uh, well, the churches must have been built uh, out of stone, I imagine, because they were taxed, whereas uh, the parish halls were uh, more like temporary or wooden structures that uh, were not uh, taxed. Um, from east to west, the existing religious buildings were the state-supported Frederick Lutheran Church of uh, 3,400 square feet north of Fort Christian and dedicated in 1793 but still being rebuilt after the hurricane of 1788. Secondly, there existed the oldest church building, the Calvinist Dirt Reformed Church of uh, 3,100 square feet with a 3,800 square feet parish hall between Denmark Hill and Triborg. Triborg being a black, black beard castle. Officially, the Dutch Reformed Church was officially recognized in 1716. The same church was also used by the Anglicans who had no church of their own. Thirdly, upon purchasing a lot at the foot of Denmark Hill and obtaining a building permit in 1796, the Jews built an 1,800 square foot congregation hall, not yet classified by the tax collector as a synagogue. Le Dru gave an uncomplimentary comment that the quotes, the Jews, numerous and quite rich, have an ill-kept synagogue where they exercise the cult of Moses. Nowhere have I seen religious functions performed with so little seriousness. These Israelites, more preoccupied with business than religion, enter, leave, re-enter, and chat as though at the stock exchange. You may see them shifting from one seat to another and reading account books while the rabbi and his Levites grate your ears with their shrinking voices." Unquote. Fourthly, fourthly came the Roman Catholic congregation, mostly French refugees, which was supported in part by the governor and taxed only for a 1,400 square foot parish hall, not classified as a church. Presumably located at the foot of Frenchman Hill, present location of uh, St. Peter and, and Paul Cathedral, built shortly after 1767. Finally, it should be noted that though the Moravian Church had been present on island since 1732, it had no presence in town at its two missions to evangelize the slaves New Harnhut and Niski were located in the countryside uh, to the east and the west of town, respectively. Charlotte Amalia was dominated and defended by Fort Christian and two old defensive towers in disrepair. Frederick's Fort, Bluebeard Castle, as we call it today, and Tribord, which we call Blackbeard Castle. All three masonry structures were built before 1700. The fort had a garrison of 100 professional soldiers quartered in the nearby barracks and supplemented in times of war by a militia of 360 men. Additionally, the harbor was uh, further defended at its entrance by a battery at Paco Point, a state back row and Prince Frederick's battery close to shore at Janssen Point on the southern tip of Oregon Hullet Peninsula, today's Hassel Island. Both were built around 1780. In 1801, the British improved the defenses of the harbor by fortifying the peninsula. They built two batteries at, on the crest, Cowell's Battery to the south, 
and Shipley's factory to the north. Additionally, the British built barracks, officers' quarters, and a hospital uh, for their soldiers, also on the crest, but at the center of uh, the peninsula. Dr. Curran. Right. Are any of the ruins of the batteries still in existence on the shore side, on the Frenchman's Bay side? Uh, the, the question is, is there any of the batteries on the shore side, the St. Thomas, the main island side, still in existence? No. Other than traces at Fort Christian. Okay. Castle Island has the only existing Napoleonic era British war structures on U.S. soil. Thank you. Well, let's talk about the harbor traffic in uh, Charlotte Amalia. Uh, Charlotte you know, 1803 can be estimated that a total of nearly 500 trading vessels, barks, rigs, schooners, and sloops sailed into the port of Charlotte Amalia. They came from all the Antilles, South America, North America, Europe, and West Africa. Concerning the maritime traffic from America, Europe, and Africa alone, the arrival list of 1805, available only between May 15th and December 31st, gives a count of 55 vessels. Uh, for a number of arrivals. On a prorated race basis, all other conditions being equal, for the full year of 1805, the count should reach about 88 arrivals, which should be uh, a good estimate of the arrival count also for 1803. Thus, it is estimated that in 1803, there were 42 vessel arrivals from the eastern coast of America, that is uh, Baltimore, Boston, Charleston, New York, Philadelphia, Savannah, uh, and Wilmington. Uh, they were bringing uh, salted fish, meat, uh, French wines, and other foods and wood products, such as uh, lumber, staves, shingles, etc. From the, from the northern European ports of Altena, Bremen, Christiana, Copenhagen, Flensburg, and Hamburg, Kiel, and Turning, came about 37 vessels bringing salted food, wooden implements, rope, linen, soap, candle, etc. And from Great Britain, uh, Bristol, Lancaster, Liverpool, and London came about uh, three vessels laden with woolen cloth, jewelry, stoneware, hardware, and other manufactured good. The 1805 arrival list does not mention European arrivals from Italian and Dutch ports. However, Le Dru estimated that in 1796, a total of about 35 ships arrived from Italian ports, that is Genoa, Leghorn, Livorno, Nice, Ragusa, and Venice, bringing olive oil, cured ham and fish, pasta, soap, cotton, and silk fabrics, uh, clothing, hats, shoes, etc. And <coughs> about 10 vessels came from Amsterdam with Dutch and Flemish sorted fish, cheese, and manufactured products. Since Napoleon essentially annexed the Batavia Republic in 1795 and Italy in 1797, it should not be surprising if the British Navy blockaded all the Dutch and Italian ports subsequently, thereby cutting communications with the, the Dutch Antilles and Charlotte Amalia. This could also explain why Le Dru's estimate for arrivals in 1796 from America, Europe, and Africa as 210 arrivals is more than twice the same estimate of arrivals, 88 in uh, 1805 from the passenger list. Although the uh, slave trade in the Danish islands was to stop at the end of 1802 by royal edict, 
it is estimated that from the 1805 data, that in 1803, six slave ships, mostly American ships, came from West Africa, with each one, each vessel holding from 120 to 340 captives, for a total of about a thousand West Africans. It is not clear how many of these ships were transiting or disembarking their captives at Charlotte Amalia. However, it is known that some of the port's merchants were slave traders, and it can be conservatively estimated that at least half of these African captives were disembarked to be resold locally in the Danish West Indies and uh, to other islands. Concerning the inter-Caribbean traffic, a list of 240 arrivals from 31 ports <coughs> between May 15th and December 31st, 1805, provides some indication of what the Caribbean trade might have been in 1803. Uh, and if you look at the list of the ports of origin, St. Croix comes first. Uh, I guess it was really exporting most of its, uh, of its products, uh, namely sugar, from using St. Thomas as a port of departure for Europe. Uh, St. Bart's, strangely enough, was the second port of origin with uh, 32 arrivals from St. Bart's. And uh, St. Bart's was then under uh, Swedish administration and was considered neutral. So uh, just as occurred uh, in uh, Charlotte Amalia, a lot of the those St. Bart's was another flag of convenience uh, during those conflicts between France and, and England uh, and was considered neutral. Uh, Tortola was a, a, the third in importance for the number of arrivals and that's easily understandable, it's next door. And so is Puerto Rico would be the the fourth more uh, frequent. And after that we have St. Kitts and uh, San Domingue, Curacao, Trinidad, and after that, you know, it just... So you, you have, but you have uh, so many different uh, ports of origin uh, that are represented, you know, at least uh, I estimate like about 40 of them. Yeah. Um, it's interesting that that they did have arrivals from the French uh, islands that would where they would be able to break through the blockade. Um, and in fact, uh, since Guadeloupe had at its head a commissar. Uh, revolutionary, I mean a Republican, who not being able to receive supplies from uh, metropolitan France was using uh, in uh, Charlotte de Malia an agent, Citoyen Michel, who uh, was essentially uh, selling Guadeloupe products and purchasing supplies for, for Guadeloupe, for the government of, of Guadeloupe at the time, as though he were uh, a council or 
but in fact he was a, a commercial agent. And his name does appear on, on the census rolls. Um, Question? Yes. You're mentioning points of origin. Where were these being arrived? Where were these documents, these um, data uh, accumulated? Where were they arriving? Oh, this is from our, our collection of um, the departure, I mean, um, what do you call it, Rob? Arrivals. The passenger list, basically. The pa passenger. Yeah. So we, we have. Into where? Into both St. Croix and St. Thomas. There's lists of passenger arrivals from 1800 to 1900 that we have on DVD. They're in the Danish archives, and they... Um, digitize them onto 35 DVDs, which are available online in here as well. And there's a finding aid available online as well. Yeah. yeah, so you can get from that, you can get the name of the captain, the name of the boat, and where it came from. Dr. Cron? Yes. Did you also get the six slave ship information from that? Or you yes, know? yes. That's where I got it from. Right. Well, let's talk now about the population of uh, Charlotte Amalia. The economic development of the port of Charlotte Amalia at the end of the 18th century could not have occurred without a parallel democratic, demographic growth. At, at that time, because of the low birth rate and high infant mortality, the population of Charlotte and Malia increased primarily through immigration. Between 1790 and 1803, a large number of Antillian and European immigrants came to Charlotte and Malia for political and economic reasons, resulting from the French Revolution and the subsequent Napoleonic Wars. The major source of Antillian immigrants was from the Dutch islands, Curaçao and St. Eustatius, and the French islands, Martinique, Guadeloupe, and Saint-Domingue. Immigration from the British West Indies and from North America was less important. In addition, there was a significant European immigration from France, the German states, uh, Denmark, Great Britain, the Netherlands, and the Italian states. Immigration from Spain and the Spanish New World colonies was almost nil. In fact, at that time, uh, Spain was actively seeking Catholic immigrants for the colonies from whatever source, provided that they were willing to pledge allegiance to the Spanish crown. Finally, it should be noted that the Port Jews, Sephardim and Ashkenazim, residing in Europe and the New World, constituted a large ethnic group of immigrants who originated from many North European ports, St. Eustatius, Curaçao, and to a lesser extent, the British Islands and Saint-Domingue. The study of the population of Charlotte Amalia between 1790 and 1803 is facilitated primarily by the annual tax list in lieu of any census. In the annual tax list, the European and the free colored taxpaying households and businesses are listed separately. Both classes ha are given in an alphabetic order based upon the surname for the Europeans, but for the free colors, the order is based upon the first name. That's rather confusing. The tax list of Charlotte Amalia included with each household or business the number and the sex of adult and minor family members, their employees and their slaves. Until 1803, only the adult slave men and women carried an annual head tax of 64 skilling, or 0.67 rix dollar per head to be paid by the European or the free colored owners. 
Although shown on the tax list, children of slaves were not taxed, presumably in order to promote the growth of the Creole slave population as the slave trade was coming to an end. In addition, starting in 1803, European and free colored households and businesses were taxed according to the surface area of their buildings located within the town limits at the rate, <coughs> at the rate of three skillings per alum. Since one alum was worth 4.24 square feet, the tax rate amounted to 0.70 skillings per square foot. The year of 1803 is exceptional also because it is the year of the first census of the free colors of Charlotte and Maria. Unfortunately, the 1803 census does not include Europeans, nor does it give street addresses only quarter of the residents. However, it does provide much personal information on the free colored adults, namely their age, the number of children, place of birth, mode of acquisition of freedom, years of residency in the Danish islands, occupation, character reference, and identity documents. In 1803, for just the town of Charlotte Amalia, by the way, this, this was uh, reprinted and transcribed by David Knight. It, it's a very useful uh, publication that we have, I think, at least three three copies of it, and I would recommend it to anybody that's interested in that period. It is really uh, a gold mine. In 1803, for just the town of Charlotte Maria, the tax list included 4,187 persons, which was comprised of 2,471 slaves, 761 free colors, and 955 Europeans. This population total of 4,187 is assuredly low, and it is understated by perhaps as much as 2,000 free persons, as estimated by Neeson. Uh, it can be safely assumed that the tax list total for the slave population, 2,471, is reliable because Danish authorities were well known for their diligence in the collection of taxes. Would you say that? <laughs> uh, for their collection of taxes and because of slaves were difficult to conceal in town. However, the true totals for the free colors and the Europeans must be higher than given by the 1803 tax list. As an international neutral port, Charlotte and Mali always attracted a large number of transient sailors and refugees, both political and economic, who did not appear on the tax list because they required some time to become settled and because they did not own adult slaves or real property in town. In fact, the large influx of poor, often undocumented free coloreds with seemingly no means of legal support is what impelled the Danish authorities to take a census of the free coloreds in 1803. This 1803 census reveals that the true number of the free colors is twice as large as the tax list number for the year 1803. In other words, according to the census, the, the true total was 1,521 versus only 761 according to the tax list. As concerned the Europeans Neeson wrote that they too were arriving every day in great numbers, but as long as they did not bring slaves or purchase, 
slaves and buildings in town, they too would not appear on the tax list. It will then be assumed, therefore, that the number of Europeans given by the 1803 tax list represents only a fraction of the true total number. In the absence of any information concerning what that fraction might be, the simplest assumption will be made that, as in the case of the free colors in 1803, the tax list only includes half of the Europeans. In other words, it's estimated that about 950 Europeans, recent immigrants, owning neither buildings nor slaves, resided in Charlotte Amalia in 1803 and were not ex included in the tax list. Thus, it's estimated that in 1803, the total population of Charlotte Amalia was about 5,900 persons, including the three social classes, 2,471 slaves, that's 42% of the population, 1,521 free colors, that's 26% of the population, and about 1,910 Europeans, or 32% of the population. So on, on that basis, um, We estimate then that the total population, uh, say, uh, in the 1780s, was about it was about constant, but uh, we estimate that it was somewhere around 2,800. That's, and we're talking about the town population proper. This is all we're talking about. We're not talking about plantations and so forth. Uh, so, 2,800 during the 80s, an average. Then, starting in 1790, uh, we have about a little lower, 2,737, and it, it keeps rising from that point Say like in 1795, it would have been like 3,546. And it quickly from there increases, say 1798, 4,153. And then jumps to uh, 6,361 in 1800. Then, because of the British occupation, drops down to 5,443 in 1802, and back up to 5,902 in 1803. Now what's happening proportionately to the three groups, the three classes? Well, the number of slaves does increase slightly, but its proportion compared to the whole population goes down. In other words, back in the 1780s, the proportion of the slaves was like 56% of the population. And in 1800, uh, it's estimated that there were only 40% of the population. And uh, during the British occupation, it looks like it increased. Uh, to 43 percent uh, as a result. But anyway, meantime, the free colors really, uh, their proportion really dramatically increased. In 1780s, only 13 percent of the population were free colors. Then, uh, as you go, to, say, to 1795, uh, it's still low, uh, like 11 percent, but suddenly by 1800 it has jumped to 22 percent. And 1802, it's the only group that increased during 
German, I mean uh, British occupation. Uh, in 1802, it's 24%, and 1803, it reaches 26%. So, in the meantime, the European proportion is essentially constant around 31, 32% during all these years. So, what, what is most dramatic is, is the huge <coughs> influx of free colors. And it is clear that St. Thomas, I mean Charlotte and Malia, became the big center for the free colors. It had the largest free colored population of the whole of the West Indies. Yes, sir? Do we have any idea what their occupation was? Yes. We're coming to that. <laughs> yes. That's very interesting, too. Uh, in essence, they they were the artisans. They were the small businessmen and, and the artisans. They were the skilled laborers and the small businessmen. Of the three social classes of Charlotte and Maria, the slaves constituted the class with the smallest population increase over the 13-year period from 1790 to 1803. They were predominantly men, 78% were men, with few women, 20%, and even fewer children, 2%. They were brought as captives, mostly from West African ports, and they were used primarily as stevedores stock managers, and assistants to tradesmen. The quality of their life improved significantly during that period due to several factors. Their commercial value increased with the abolition of the slave trade, which started in 1803, although not truly effective until 1807. The spread of the liberal ideas, the French Revolution, the Danish authorities were deadly afraid of the French sans-culottes that were spreading these uh, very uh, extreme ideas about uh, liberté, égalité, fraternité. <laughs> so, uh, but it did spread. There was no way they could stop it. Um, you should know that uh, in the French islands, uh, Guadeloupe and Saint-Domingue, uh, there was uh, abolition of slavery that was declared, emancipation was declared in 1793. So the whole of the islands knew all about that. And uh, of course, Napoleon uh, reestablished slavery in 1802. But I suspect that a lot of of these emancipated slaves ran to St. Thomas or to Charlotte Amalia uh, rather than go back to slavery. And I think that's why the so-called free colored population increased so much because in fact I would say about half of the free coloreds were undocumented. So you know that some of them were were fleeing from being put back in slavery because uh, they couldn't prove that that they were really uh, free colored. Nevertheless, uh, so they they found their refuge here uh, as long as they kept quiet and they didn't start any trouble. It's the the Danish authorities were rather conservative. Anyway, um, yeah, another reason why the uh, conditions improved for the slaves is was the inability of the Danish port authorities to keep a strict control over a large and fluctuating immigrant urban population. 
And as I said, I think that many of them were, in, in fact, uh, supposed to be slave free. And then also, finally, there was a negligent attitude on the application of Danish ordinances on the part of the Danish, of the English occupation authorities in 1801, vis-a-vis -vis the, the uh, civilian population. The English uh, was not as, as strict uh, as the Danes were. The free colors constituted the middle class. It was the fastest growing and the most vibrant social class. Certainly at that time, 18, 1790 to 1803, Charlotte Maria, among all the other ports of the Lesser Antilles, must have been the largest concentration of free colors. Only 52% of the free colors were native to the Danish West Indies, while 20% were native to the French Antilles, 17% were native to the Dutch Antilles, 7% from the British and, uh, West Indies, and a surprising 4% were natives of, of uh, West Africa. In fact, uh, I found that there were 64 free West Africans living in 1803 in Charlotte and Mali. They had previously been in bondage, most of them, uh, under Danish rule in, in St. Thomas. Um, but um, they'd gotten emancipated one way or the other. Some bought themselves out of slavery and others were given their freedom by their owners. But 60, I was surprised that there were as many as 60. Um, most of the immigrants uh, arrived in the port after the start of the French Revolution, specifically after 1793. Each incoming free colored group came with its own Creole culture, music, dance, food, and language, which they blended with the less developed culture of the Danish islands um, to enrich it. Because many free colored men were sailors at sea, they were not <coughs> counted by the, the Danish census takers. And consequently, it appears as though they were two or three times as many women as men residing in Charlotte Amalia. The children of the free colors were few, and they averaged one child per woman. <coughs> The declared occupation of the women was mostly seamstress, laundress, or vendors, not to say hucksters. Their numbers were far beyond the needs of Charles de Malia, and therefore they must have been supported, at least in part, by their seafaring husbands and mates, who were crewing on the many inter-island vessels sailing under the Danish flag. Most of the crews of the inter-island vessels were free colors. And, and a good number of captains as well. The declared occupation of the men included in the census was mostly tailor, carpenter, mason, and seaman. In fact, most of the free colored men based in Charlotte and Maria were small businessmen and highly skilled artisans. The free colors owned from about <coughs> one sixth up to one third of the slaves of Charlotte and Malia. And in 1803, they owned 701 slaves among <coughs> 275 households and businesses. Finally, also in 1803, 271 households <coughs> businesses of free colors on 222,000 square feet of real property located in all three quarters of town. Um, I read many places that the free colors were supposed to live only in, uh, 
in Saban and uh, Princess Princess uh, Quarter, but in fact they own property all over town, and and that's obvious from uh, again David Knight's census that shows that the distribution of the free colored population was all over town. Of course. Most of them, I mean, there was a greater proportion in Crown Prince's uh, quarter, but nevertheless, it was significant population in the other two quarters. Uh, this amounted to an average of uh, 820 square feet per uh, per property owner. We talk about the free colors. Clearly, as the economy grew the free colors were able to accumulate wealth and the quality of their lives improved partly as a result of the spreading of the new liberal ideas from the French Revolution and in spite of the old discriminatory ordinances which the overwhelmed <coughs> Danish authorities were often unable to enforce. So, um, yeah, now we come to the European uh, population, which uh, unfortunately I wasn't able to get a whole lot of information about them. The Europeans constituted the upper class, which included uh, Danish functionaries with a garrison of 100 men and very few merchants. They constituted the, the Danes constituted about 21% of the Charlotte Amalia European population. Other Europeans, mostly merchants and traders, often owing uh, cargo vessels, were the French, 22%, mostly from the French Antilles with few from France. The Anglo-Saxons, 20%, out of St. Eustatius, the British West Indies, and America, the Jews, 18%, and the Dutch, uh, 4%, out of Curacao and St. Eustatius. The Germans, 9% from the Baltic seaports. The Italians, 3% from Genoa. And the Spaniards, 2%, mostly out of Puerto Rico. Just as in the case of the free colors, most Europeans came to Charlotte Amalia after 1793, and as a result of the revolution and the Napoleonic Wars. Unlike the free colors, the Europeans had a deficiency of women, since they had only 0.7 women per man, and had few children as well, 1.2 child per woman. In 1803, the Europeans of Charlotte Amalia owned 1,770 slaves. This was two and a half times more than slaves than that owned by the uh, free coloreds. But since most uh, more European household uh, and businesses own slaves, the average number of slaves per European household, 3.8, was was not much higher than that for the free colored households, which was 2.5. Finally, also in 1803, 199 European as opposed to 275 free colored households and businesses own property in town. This difference is in part a reflection of the fact that a greater population of Europeans were newcomers to Charlotte Amalia. On the other hand, the total surface area of European owned property, 592,000, almost 600,000 square feet, was 2.7 times higher, and therefore the average surface area per European household, about 3,000 square feet, was 3.6 times that of the free colored households and businesses. In some during the period of 1790 to 1803, the Europeans of Charlotte and Maya were prospering, perhaps more so than the free colors, but those directly out of Europe 
had greater problems adapting to the new riskier living and trading conditions. As a consequence, many non-Creole Europeans either died prematurely of some tropical fever or were ruined by privateering losses at sea and returned to where they originated within a few years after the Napoleonic Wars. So in other words, what I'm saying is, is that the free colors were better able to adapt and to make Saint Charlotte and Maria their permanent home than the Europeans. Well, that's it for now. Now, I, I must say that I put a big emphasis on giving lists of names of people, so which obviously I can't do for this presentation. So if you're curious about what are some of the names, I, uh, as I repeat again, it'll be available here either in paper or on the net, on the, on the web page. Uh, so, if there are any questions, uh, Dr. Caron, uh, Ron Harrigan, for those of you who uh, don't know who I am, uh, I'm interested in the in the Curacao connection. You know, that's where. And trace my family yeah. in the so and uh, as to who were the people who migrated from Cairo so I know for sure that we had the Sephardic Jews them. all of them yeah but uh, the proportion of colored people that came out of Cairo so yeah uh, they, came, they came out as slaves or did they come out as us <laughs> you know I'm you know, not it was a free for all it was a free for all the, the Danish I mean the Dutch administration was in total disarray because of the Brit uh, British-French conflict mm -hmm. and also uh, the Dutch administration was unable to raise taxes. They couldn't even feed their slaves. So many of, so the government had to let go a lot of the slaves because they were unable to feed them. And besides that, of course, the French uh, privateers came and played havoc there. And uh, so, I mean, the whole thing is total confusion. Mm -hmm. So specifically, what time yourself. period are you talking about when you talk about that? About, you know, 17, 1793 to 1815. Yeah, okay, yeah. Well, the, the British took over 1810 in, in Curso. So I guess they must have imposed some semblance of order. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's put it this way between 17, um, yeah, 1795 and, and 17 or 93 even, and 1810. It was kind of a free for all. I mean, you know, everything was at a standstill. Uh, there was no trade to be made or anything. Communications with with uh, uh, Holland was cut and so forth. So, I mean, it, it was total confusion. But the Danes also suffered from. Um they couldn't get corn that period from the states to feed their slaves, especially in St. Croix. I read that they, they were short of food for them. Well, technically speaking, um, uh, American vessels were allowed by the British to come to, to trade. Uh, except, I guess, uh, with the 1812 uh, war after that. But uh, before, before 1812, um, a great proportion of, of the trading vessels came from uh, the American East Coast. And it was over that whole question, you know, that, uh, America claimed to be neutral to be able to 
to go through the British blockade and trade with the French during that period. And of course, Britain took exception to that, and that's what started the 1812 war, right, Charles? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, no, I, 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 my uh, U.S. history is very limited, but I, I do know that the, the question of America wanted free trade and uh, coming to blows with, uh, with Britain in 1812. It just as an interesting aside, during the War of 1812, American ships supplied wheat and corn to the British soldiers in Spain under license from the British government. Wow. <laughs> and that was to fight uh, Napoleon. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, at that time. During the war. Yeah. With yeah. America. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, excuse me, the, um, yeah. you don't extend your theory uh, into St. John, do you? I mean, it's all St. Thomas, but but St. John, I, Saint John didn't, Saint have, didn't have... St. John didn't have... St. John, Saint John did have a sizable population of, of free blacks who owned slaves. Not a sizable, but I think they did They have. came much later. <coughs> I don't believe that St. St. John was strictly rural at that time. Um, see, most of the free colors in Charlotte and Maria were originally urban people. They were not uh, people that came from plantations. So St. John was, was still bush country. Yeah. I, it's another sort of strange yeah. button making. Was that listed as any of these uh, in, um, craftsman skills? Because it seems to be a, a, so, somewhat pervasive to dig up on Congress got it. Yeah. Uncovered a lot of evidence of it. We found a couple of buttons out of Prince Frederick's battery that were locally made. Oh, was really? This, yeah. Was this a. I'm surprised because, see, the handles on, on the, what do you call it, the drawers on, of, uh, what do you call them, commodes or, uh, set of drawers uh, yes, on furniture. Knobs. Well, knobs. The knobs were all generally wood, oh, wood no, knot, we're, we're talking and they about, were imported from France. We're talking about yeah. buttons for clothing. Right. Bones. Right. And and, and but wood. but how would they be able to make them out of brass? They made them out of shell. shell. Oh, okay, shell. okay. Shell. 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 All right, all right. All right. No, I thought you were saying. No, 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 yes. Shells. Yes. 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 I didn't see that trade uh, specifically, but I'm certain that uh, it, it was done locally. Yeah, I agree. But there was a lot of skills in uh, carpenters and, and some masons, but carpenters were uh, really, and most of them were really shipwrights. Uh, fixing uh, that they could do both building uh, houses and uh, building vessels, uh, ships. Yes. Winston Adams. Yes. I can understand the trade between the United States and St. Croix being primarily uh, sugar cane. Right. But what was the main product for exchange in St. Thomas? Well, they were, you know, shoes, linen clothing, uh, salt fish, uh, salt pork. That's products coming in. That they would, they would exchange their sugar for these products in, in Charlotte and Maria. Yeah. So Charlotte and Maria was a prime sugar port also? Well, as an export, yes. 
they were exporting sugar. It wasn't, Charlotte Amalia was always a place where merchandise changed hands. Yeah. Okay. We brought hides up from the Caribbean, from Central America, lots of those products. They were traded here for the products from Europe. Some of it stayed here, but the rest of it went all back down. The so theoretically, St. Thomas had no viable trade market of their own products of their own. Right. Very little. Very little. Right. 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 Very little. Trade center. Yeah, it was. <coughs> it was a trade center. Well, we were doing that up until uh, he moved back site and there. Uh, <laughs> you know, we said come back set over there on the on the dock. Yeah. Or from somewhere and then it was something that was that was coming. But what really made the wealth of the first boom, economic boom, was trading illicitly with the Puerto Rican planters. That would because Puerto Rico the the Spanish government <coughs> imposed both an export and an import tax. So it was worthwhile to uh, sneak out of, of, of Puerto Rico with, with your products, buy European goods or supplies here in exchange, and smuggle it back, sneak it back in, in Puerto Rico without paying taxes. So I mean, you avoided two taxes. And uh, it took a long time for the Spaniards to catch on. <laughs> Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. <laughs> uh, do feel more now. Yes, uh, sir. I'm, I'm sure this is the topic in itself of another paper. Uh, you may mention uh, 2.5 slaves per household of three colors, as opposed to 3.5 for three. 3.8, yeah. <laughs> Do you have any information on after the abolition of slavery in the Danish West Indies, what the transition was like comparatively to the two groups, the oh, no, I'm sorry, slaves yeah. and uh, household sorry. and uh, European slaves? Yeah, I'm, I'm learning. I I haven't reached that. Michelangelo said. I'm, I haven't reached that that year left. See, I'm starting at the bottom. I take. 1790 to 1803 is kind of my baseline. So if I live on long enough, <laughs> I'll reach <laughs> the later years in the, in the 19th century. But I, I thought that would be the baseline. So I, ca I can't tell you much about the rest. Uh, so that will really be an interesting study because I, what, what made you ask the question on that? The data that he gave, uh, you mentioned that abolition in 1803 but taking full effect in 1807, and your tax list of 1843 showed colored households. Oh, oh yeah, no, I don't mean abolition. I mean the trade. international slave trade. Oh, trade. In other words, for, uh, uh, taking captives away from West Africa and bringing them here. In other words, supposedly, technically speaking, after 1807, all the, the slaves in the Danish islands had to be uh, Creole. In other words, born here. They, they, you, couldn't, you couldn't bring in uh, slaves from from West Africa. But if I may respond to the, to the well, question, to me, uh, what, what prompted my interest in it is um, the nature of slavery being not only racial but also economic yeah. for free colors to economically uh, benefit from having slaves as well in their, in their arsenal. So for but the laws in 1792 would they prohibit any slaves from Africa to come here, but they got 10 years, so 1802 they stopped bringing slaves, but they could bring slaves to here and ship them down to other islands. Yes. And that's the reason they used to women instead, so we get more free slaves. Right. And that's how it would happen. Yeah, and also they pass an ordinance that yeah. um, the governor passed an ordinance where um, you couldn't uh, use slaves for domestic labor. 
um, or at least it was discouraged uh, because their that their labor was more needed than on the plantation rather than doing domestic work. So it did have an impact. The the end of the slave trade. Yes. Um, comparing the laws that had to do with slavery in the U.S. to the Caribbean, uh, which you what? I'm comparing sorry. the laws for slavery in the U.S. to what was happening in the Caribbean, it seems like you're saying that free colors, um, or, or blacks in general, they owned slaves here, they owned property, they were traveling. Were the laws in the Caribbean more favorable to? to blacks as opposed to the U.S. where in some places they were not allowed to own property even if they inherited it from their master. Yeah, I'm or, sorry, but I don't know much about the U.S. I, re I really don't know. Um, sorry. In yes, part of your presentation, you indicated a percentage of blacks or slaves from Africa, and the number of females was very low. The number of, of females yes, slaves were yes, very low. Yes. And I'm trying to understand, based on that number, how were they able to increase their population since slavery was abolished, bringing slaves in? Well, first of all, we're <coughs> talking about urban slaves now, mm -hmm. okay? So this is totally different from from uh, plantation slavery. Plantation slavery. Uh, the other thing is, in other words, men were needed for heavy work, you know, steve stevedores and mm -hmm. so on and so forth, and also for uh, as assistance to tradesmen, to artisans. Um, now the question of increasing the population, uh, most of the increases occurred uh, through incoming slaves. That was, that was the way they, especially, see, during these troubled times, a lot of um, slave owners from the French and the Dutch island came here with their slaves. Uh, and uh, they sold their slaves locally, but there was no big slave market, by the way. And so the urban slaves were sort of sold in, in small numbers through uh, sort of like personal connections or, you know, like today you sell a car through the classified ads, that sort of thing. There was no big slave market uh, for, the, for the urban slaves. Uh, but uh, so most of the increase in numbers that occurred, and mind you, keep in mind that their percentage were going, was going down compared to the other two classes in the population, was the, those numbers increased from immigration not through uh, being born here. From, yeah. And, yes? My other question had to do with St. Mark's. You said that it was one of the biggest um, arrival places that the boats were arriving from. And you also said that uh, some of the Europeans once they had been here for a while, if it wasn't working out, they went back to where they had come from. Um, but in looking at uh, the census information for Gustavia, the capital of St. Bart's, when that population changed, it didn't come back. So where did those people continue to, if you found that in your research? The ones that came from St. Bart's to St. Thomas, where did they go afterwards? Uh, it was, we're talking about trading vessels. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about a population migrating from St. Bart's to St. Thomas. Just 
Charlotte and Marty. A lot of the census records for the early 1800s, 1820s, 1815, for St. Thomas, cites a lot of people being born in St. Bart's from Charlotte and Marty. I found that when I've gone through researching. So some of them say, I don't know, they may not have arrived in the same ships that you're referring to, but there were quite a few that cited St. Mars as their birthplace. Well, <clears throat> let's put it this way, up to the 1803, I, I don't see large numbers. In fact, it, in the, um, I could find only like three St. Bart's names, Bernier, Quetel, and uh, I forget, there's a, there's a third one that I found. Maybe it's so bad, mm -hmm. who knows? Um, these weren't French names. They were they were uh, English names. They were uh, just. But yeah, these first Saint Bart's people were associated with trade. Uh, they could they could be uh, like like they have Madame Bernier on on one of those uh, tax lists, and I suspect that. Uh, her husband must have been a, a sea captain because they didn't call her Widow Bernier, they called her Madame Bernier. And where was Monsieur Bernier? <laughs> you know? So <laughs> what I'm saying is, is that whatever population from St. Mark's that there was at that time, I mean up to 1803, was small and was had to do with trade, strictly trade. Could I, could I ask a question about yes. uh, uh, the French Antilles? You, you mentioned that there was a period of time when it was emancipation in 17 something. 1790. Yeah. So we're talking about Guadeloupe, Martinique, uh, St. Not Martinique. The Royalists invited the British to take over. Oh. <laughs> and they, they stopped the, all the French Republicans had to flee. And so the emancipation was never declared in, in Martinique. And when the British left, Napoleon took over. And of course, by then, he was so happy to keep the slaves where they belonged, he felt. So, <coughs> so this will also uh, play out to St. Bart's and Mar St. Martin and so on, in terms of their slaves as well. St. Bart's was Swedish. At the time? Yes. 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 Oh, yes. And St. Bart's did not have years, its emancipation uh, uh, until St. Thomas and, and the second emancipation in the French islands. Oh. Hmm. Okay. 16, I mean, 1848. I'm finding also that at 1793, date is really important because we see um, three colored French yeah. coming into the island with their enslaved Africans um, and occupying a certain area in Charlotte Amali um, in ahead of that emancipation occurring yes. um, so that they're bringing now enslaved Africans that they have already been living in a French area probably uh, what what name do these people were? I mean, they had the French names or? Um, yes. I have seen <laughs> names like, oh, I'm not French. Passé? Yes, Passé. Um, and so forth, yes. Very much so. Um, I'm seeing Passé, I'm seeing Gabriel, I'm oh, Gabriel seeing... Gabriel is also French? Yeah, I'm seeing Brun? Brun? Brun. Who is this spelling? B-R-U-N. Brun. Yeah, I'm seeing like like maybe yeah, four yeah, or five yeah. families that I'm sort of following okay, okay. that are all living in the same area, all speaking French, very Catholic, um, and they all seem to have arrived right in 1792 and 93 with enslaved Africans. I think we, we focus so much on the traditional French names, the, uh, we have a wrong name, the net and the tell and the love, but when you add those people, you won't think about them as being uh, coming from that. Yeah. Well, if you see E A U at the end of the name, you can be sure it's French. Yeah. 
And there are many other tricks like that. Are they, are they tricks? E N T. <laughs> no, but I, you know, I, I guess I'm, I'm a Frenchman, so I, I can tell a name when it's French, although there's some that could be either English or French, like Colin or Colin or Martin, Martin, so on and so forth. Petit and Petit. But anyway, uh, leaving aside the uh, uh, Norman conquest of England, <laughs> bringing its own set of names to England. Yes, sir. Where did the non-European Spanish populations fit into the category that you listed, the Europeans, the free governments, and you had slaves? Where did the, the Spanish populations from Puerto Rico in the Cuban area, where did they fit in that category, in those categories? You mean as, as slave owners? Well, no. They, were they considered Europeans? Were they considered free colored? Were they, they were not slaves. Or oh, Puerto Ricans, well, if they, if they were Spaniards, either Creoles or they were counted as, as being Spanish, I mean, um, as being European, whether they be Creoles or just coming from Spain. Um, so long as, by European I mean that they're not mixed with, with Africans. Uh, we talk about very early days, I mean compared to today. But you see, a lot of families had two branches already. That's what amazed me, is that you had many families already in, in 1800 that had both a free colored and, and a European branch. And so mixing between Europeans and Africans started very early, very early. Have you done any startup talk about slaves that the British took thousands of Irish people and sent them to the island south? Thousands, literally. Which is the reason you have all these blue eyes on this various island from, from the Irish? Is there any study you come across that some of these ended up here or did, were they straight down island? Uh, if, you, if you could just Google, yeah. I mean, uh, no, Irish slave in the Caribbean, you're going those to Those that came from the British Isles were, were generally fewer. Um, the, yeah, the Irish were mixed quite a bit with, with the Africans because they were more or less, socially speaking, at the same level. They were not allowed to practice their religion, have their own priests. But they were sold. And they were... They were indentured servants, had to serve at least seven years, and, and so they were. And then they were quartered together with the Africans. But I don't free, see that. We use the word indentured servant, but they were really slaves. Yeah, I, I saw yeah, something on the internet one yeah. time, uh, especially in Montserrat. It, it's they like were slaves in Montserrat, but yeah. they didn't last. It's because a very of the large slaves. number, and it's seldom spoken of. It, it, I mean, the British hated the Irish so much that they yeah. just. They scooped them down island and... It, well, they didn't trust them. <laughs> but, yeah, you have to say that. We, we didn't see them here in the Danish West Indies. In my study of um, slavery here in the territory, you did not see that large group um, being sent to this territory at any one time being brought in or anything like that. You saw indentured, but you saw Indian indentured. You did not see Irish indentured here in the territory. And the Indian no, indentured no. was even fewer. I know that, but since that later on in that period there were some of the free slaves that came up here. I'm just wondering if there were some Irish blood in them, but apparently that's not, it didn't occur. Well, there were probably some slip through. Yeah, <laughs> maybe yeah, a, but maybe a hair again or so two. Many, I mean, yeah. yeah, I think it may have come uh, later. 
No, actually, there was a study done. I mean, I, I, there was a presentation made by David Knight at the St. John uh, right. Society, and he presented on the Anguillians coming up through to St. John and settling in St. John. And many of the names were Irish names. Right. You know? Well, Anguillians. And then going to St. Croix. Well. Anguillians were, were too poor to own too many slaves. So it was mostly poor whites in Anguilla. And, and so wherever you see, see the poor islands like St. Bart's, Anguilla, those are primary, are today color wise are mostly white because the people were too poor to own slaves. It's, it's that simple. So um, that's, that's historically that's what happened. And, uh, so the Anguillians uh, were always moving to other, pla to other islands because their own island wasn't enough to support them. But I think that much of that occurred uh, between Anguilla and the other British islands rather than, than the Danish islands, uh, except late, much later. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you everybody for coming. I hope you enjoyed Dr. Crohn's presentation. We have um, a feedback sheet that I'd like to pass out if you could take a few minutes and fill it out for us and let us know what you thought and if you have any if there's any topics oh, that you would like to hear us present on. Fine. Dr. Garone spoke about uh, this particular book by David Knight, The 1803 uh, Crossroads, if anybody would like to see it. Yeah. And then also, Dr. Garone wrote a publication about um, the Amerindian populations in the Virgin Islands, and we do have it for sale. It's $20. Um, we have them in the front if anybody's interested.